Steel Bike Construction has a secret, casting. It's cheap, strong, and lets you create lightweight, beautiful parts. Cast parts used to be proudly displayed on bike frames for over 100 years, but somewhere along the way, we forgot. There are several ways to create a metal part. Machining, removing material, forming, which includes stamping, bending, and swaging, and finally, casting, which is done by pouring molten metal into a mold, and it allows you to create complex 3D geometries at really low cost. But Daniel, what about 3D printing? Fine, I'll talk about that later. The earliest known casting is this Megara amulet from Pakistan. It's been dated to be over 6,000 years old. Much like bike parts, the amulet is also made from lost wax casting. Is it a coincidence that this amulet looks just like a Mavic IO wheel set? Or that the offers refer to this artifact as artifact? The parallels between this thousand year old casting and bikes cannot be denied. Even the earliest mass produced bikes were made from steel and heavily featured cast parts. This bike was built in the 1890s by a famous pair of brothers, the Wright brothers. Even a bike built 130 years ago has cast components. The Wright brothers started off as frame builders, and their knowledge and experience of creating lightweight, efficient structures helped them build one of the greatest modern achievements, the airplane. So, maybe my frame building career is just about to take off. Get it? Bike lugs are the most iconic cast parts. Peak lug happened in the 1980s with ornate designs and shaping. Lugged construction was eventually replaced with TIG welding, which is cheaper, lighter, faster, and stronger. These days, steel bikes still have cast parts, but mostly as a cost-saving measure. Modern cast part designs are uninspired because steel bikes are no longer mainstream, and the knowledge of casting and tool making has disappeared. So we visit a factory to see how it's done. We're at c -wide, a casting factory. Bike parts are made by investment casting, also known as lost wax casting. Here's a quick overview of the process. Wax replicas are encased in a ceramic shell and molten metal is poured in, forming a part. The first step is to form the wax replicas. Check out the inside of this casting mold. This mold makes the part that makes the mold that makes the final part. Got that? A mold like this costs about 2,000 US dollars. The mold is clamped into the machine and wax is injected through the ports. Check out this gigantic mold for an e-bike motor cabinet. These molds are pretty complex. They must be designed specifically so you can mold and remove the wax parts. The factory has professional tool and die manufacturers to design these molds. At this point, the wax is really soft, so you gotta be careful handling these parts. If the wax part is damaged or warped, it will show up in the final steel part. These pieces will be basically the final product. Yeah. And also, sometimes they will have little protrusions to help them uh, be built into tree. Yeah. So let's go see the next step. Step two, attaching the wax parts to a tree. In this step, the individual wax replicas are expertly attached to specially shaped blocks known as trees. These trees have a funnel, which allows you to pour molten metal into the mold. These chainstay yokes must be placed on the tree in a very specific orientation to allow molten metal to fully penetrate the mold. Even with mass-produced parts, there's still a lot of skilled labor and craftsmanship involved. So they get built into trees, so they get ready for the next step is dipping the whole tree into a slurry coat. Step three, making the ceramic mold. So they dip the tree into the ceramic coating. Sometimes it's called slurry, and then you let it dry. After they do the dipping, it needs to be rested and dry for one day. Sometimes shorter, depending on the product, the size of the product. And it needs to be dipped six to seven times. So that means just this process alone can take up seven to eight days. Yeah, so these are being dried as well. So getting some air con to keep the temperature consistent. 
At this point, the wax parts are encased in a ceramic coating and left to dry for several days. I was surprised how long this whole process takes. Step 4. Melting the wax. In this room, the wax is melted out of the ceramic mold. We're removing the green wax out of the tree that we just saw. The wax get collected and the machine actually recycle the wax and reuse those wax for, for injection later. At this point, you have an empty ceramic mold. Step 5. Casting. After we melt the wax, we have the mold for casting. So first step is to heat up the ceramic mold. So it becomes it become like similar temperature to the molten metal that we're going to pour in. And let me check with them uh, when they're going to pour. And they already poured. Sorry guys, the factory runs on a tight schedule and the next pour was not for another few hours. These photos were from my 2024 visit with Adam Sklar. Luckily, it's 2025 and we have AI to solve these problems for us. This was basically what happened, except the humans were more realistic and the metal was not defying gravity. All right, back to real life. These molds have just been poured. Here's the raw material before it's melted. Notice the mixture of scrap metal and new metal. As we'll find out later, recycling is a big part of casting. Here are the molds after casting. They are all cracked due to the massive temperature changes. Don't worry, the molds need to be broken to remove the parts anyways. Next step is to remove the ceramic mold. A combination of giant shakers and sandblasting is used to remove all the ceramic from the parts. And the final step. Parts must be individually removed from the tree. This may look a bit tedious and dangerous, and that's because it is. Manufacturing is inherently labor intensive. This visit helped me appreciate all the work that goes into a simple $15 cast dropout. A little bit of sanding, QC, and that's how you make a cast part. But one more thing. The question that people often ask is how, how much of the material is recycled? Yeah. So really depending on how we define it, recycle. Uh, all their material is actually recycled. They, bought, they buy those material from a stamping factory. Uh, so those are basically the remainder, the remaining material from stamp. 30% is from what they chop off after they cut that off, that get melted again and recasted. They only remelt the excess cast material once. These get sold to next level in the ecosystem, which is the stand casting. You make really big parts, the bucket for the digger or the manhole cover for the sewage. Yeah, so the material get recycled. Pretty cool, huh? Steel is real recyclable. All right, time to wrap it up. How much does casting really cost? Let's talk dollars. Our production hummingbird has two cast parts, the yoke and the bottle bracket. The bottle bracket is interesting. For our USA frames, we 3D printed these parts. They cost us about $6 each. In comparison, our cast part costs $4. But we had to pay $1,600 for the tooling. This leads us to the concept called amortization. Amortization is the process of spreading out a large cost over a number of units. The more you make, the less each unit costs. In the case of the bottle bracket, it takes about 800 units for casting to be cheaper than 3D printing. That's not great, more on that later. Here's a more traditional example, dropouts. This custom UDH dropout is machined and costs about $40 to produce. A cast version would cost $15 with a tooling cost of $2,000. For comparison, 3D printing would cost about $60. We will need to produce 81 dropouts to break even and amortize the tooling costs. With dropouts, it's pretty clear that casting is much cheaper. For the bottle bracket, 3D printing is actually pretty cost competitive. That's because 3D printing is directly proportional to the mass of the part, and the bottle bracket is very light. On average, independent frame builders build 20 to 30 frames per year, so it's really hard to justify tooling costs. That's why I love designing production bikes. It allows us to mass produce our designs and bring the cost down for everyone. Thanks for watching. Hope you learned something new.